Welcome to our second day of uh, National Library, Library Review Celebrations. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of uh, announcements. Okay, so today we have Bob Bloom. He's speaking on more about on the high plane. Of course, he has another book, his brand news. Um, when I first talked to him, he didn't have that one finished. So now he's got two books. And uh, both of them will be in the library. And he will speak to us in a few minutes. And then tomorrow we have Marilyn Holt coming. And she's um, discussing confessions to Mr. Roosevelt. And if she's from Adeline, I believe, and she has been in the news with like maybe um, Ida Power and then things like that. So she's, uh, she's quite, a, quite a good author as well. There's not as much published about her on the internet. If you don't have uh, tickets yet for the murder mystery, they're $25, and it's this Saturday at um, 6 30. Don't forget the friends annual meeting is at six o'clock before this. It doesn't cost you to, to go to the annual meeting. We're just discussing what we did in the last in the last year. And the friends is putting it on and family center of health care is helping to sponsor it. So that's really exciting. Okay. I am told by Sandy here, who's a friend of Elaine, that uh, a sister, sorry, that uh, there is going to be a special wildflower um, day at the, the Little Jerusalem on May 21st. And all you will need to get in from 9 until 12 is get a park pass. So by then, I hope to have one of these Kansas Park State park passes. So if you decide that you want to go to the Little Jerusalem park and be part of that wildflower um, time at Little Jerusalem, go down to the Kansas State. Society. It's put on by the Kansas City Plant Society. You too can get it free just by coming to the library and getting your park pass. Okay. And, so if, you're ready to have a park pass. and if you already have a park pass, that's great. The thing is, if you can't get it before, we can give it to you for the next day. It's not a problem. You can fill it in. Okay. All right. And you know, we have story time going on until um, just the end of the end of April. Is that correct? To me, story time. That's all and your little ones can come at any time. Um, we do have our other purpose is signed up, and then our map set, which has to be uh, for sign up. We'll do one of those in the fall, too. So if you know someone who's having a child, a baby, um, if you're over 18 months, they can sign up and you next, next fall. And then we have an ASL class that will go until the middle of May, and then it will start at the end of the <laughs> So if you know anybody, whether they speak Spanish or some other language, they can, they can uh, learn English. And it's free, and we have board books that they work on. And then our book club this month, we are reading The Awakening by J.D. Robbins, and if you want to come, it is the first Monday of every month at 7 p.m. Okay. We're a poetry group, if you want to write poetry. Um, many of the people who attend to write poetry every once in a while, when I take a breath and get a chance, I actually write something. But um, so we there's about seven of us that come together and that's on the third Thursday of the month at two o'clock. And then we have a science fiction book club. If you love fantasy and science fiction, um, we meet on the first Sunday of the month, and Katie, who's going to be our circulation uh, person, is going to continue doing that because she loves it and she's really good. And then a thousand books before kindergarten. If you have a little one, even a grandchild or a grandniece or nephew, and you like to read to them, or their parents are complaining they don't read enough, you too could go on Facebook or on your phone or some way and, or at home, read a book to them, and then you can log it using your phone or your computer, and they can get incentives of little things that they would have fun from our library if they live here. If they live elsewhere, Sorry, unless they visit, and they get the ascendant. But they can read a thousand books before kindergarten. 
and they get really excited. And her aunt, her, she reads to her grandchildren every, just about every day. And how many books have they read? Um, Amelia was made the fast. She, she did it before kindergarten. And Margo's three, and she said, almost nine hundred. And then Arizona. Arizona. And they live in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. And so we actually, um, it, I'm pretty proud to you and what we did because her daughter was our meeting for the Arizona um, school district. And they were saying, how are we going to do this? A thousand weeks before kindergarten, they wanted her to fill out all this paper. And so her daughter said, hey, my library, little library in Colby already does it. We do it. They do it all on the phone. Uh, thanks to Judy and her, her ability to uh, uh, to adapt to technology uh, and find resources, huh? And find resources. Yes, that's correct. And find resources. That's right. And the funding of it, because it does cost to have the, the platform. And then our use activity is from three three thirty to five thirty every day, or one to five if there's no school. And then we have a ranch club. So if you want to write a book or write some memoirs or get some help. First and third Tuesday of the month. Okay. And don't forget we have digital books. Sunflower, the BP library. And then also we have note cards to give and that we can write people. Not everybody does everything by computer. So if you want to write a note, come get some of those, some of those note cards, the, the pictures, and we'll sell them to you with the friends. And remember, if we have a bad day of weather or something comes up. We put it usually first on Facebook and then our website and then on our catalog. There's three places you can find it. Okay. So, without further ado, let me have Bob Holcomb come and I will set him up for his program. Once again, I know we got nervous when I put the way, <laughs> but that's okay. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So, Bob. Wow, okay. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be all our staff here for allowing me to come here today. And, and it was good meal. We loved it. And uh, my wife, Joanne, uh, came with me. And she kind of keeps me in line. And uh, um, I'm pleased to, to be here to talk about my books. I'm a a relatively new author, at least as far as uh, the fiction aspect of it goes. Um, I, I was born in Kansas, raised in Kansas, and uh, went to Fort Hayes State University down here where I did write, uh, co-wrote some uh, scientific articles. I was a biology major. And, uh, and I found when I, was, uh, when I was doing that that I, really, I was working in the museum. And it, it's not the Sternberg Museum, uh, but it's part of the Sternberg Museum now. It's called the Museum of the High Plains, which is a research museum. Uh, and I worked in the section with the mammals and stuff kind of like that. And uh, I kind of liked museum work. And so when I graduated, uh, I um, attempted to get a job in uh, a museum, a research museum uh, associated with a university or college. And, and uh, the problem with, with that is that people don't get into that line of work because of the money or anything like that. They get into it because they like it. So you end up having to wait for somebody to retire or move or die uh, for you to be able to get uh, in, in running for one of those jobs. So, so while I was looking, uh, this job at the Fort Hayes Museum came up, and this is the old Fort, it's not the Snowbird, it's the the, uh, we, were, we were confused with the university all the time, but uh, it's on the southwest corner of Hayes. It's where the old fort was established in 1867 there. And uh, it was an army fort. And I got that job and, and I thought, well, I could do this for two or three years until I find a, a job in biology. And, and uh, so almost 30 years later, I retired from that job. <laughs> So it was uh, it turned in from went from just being a job to a career, and I wrote a lot of historical articles for uh, the uh, site has a friends group has a friends group and they have a newsletter and so I wrote quite a lot of historical uh, articles for that 
but I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was I was little, and uh, I never figured that I could actually become a published writer because it was so hard to publish things back in those days. You had to have, a, uh, as you may know, you had to have an agent and uh, an editor and a publisher and all that kind of stuff, and that cost money. And, and, uh, and but this little thing called the internet came along, and uh, you could put books on the internet, you could put ebooks up. And uh, there were a lot of people that were out there teaching you how to do that. And so when I retired in 2013, I decided that uh, this was a lifelong dream of mine is to write something in the, his, his, uh, in the fiction uh, genre so I could use my imagination. I have quite a bit of imagination sometimes as my wife will come down uh, confirm. But, uh, and they say, though, when you start writing, you should write what you know. And I knew Four Days pretty well. Uh, four Days was an interesting place. Um, it doesn't have as much left of it as uh, Forts like Fort Larned and, and so on. So we have Forts around the country, Fort Laramie. But uh, it has a very interesting history to it. And so I started writing. I figured I could write this book. I had it in my head for, for several years before I retired. And um, it was going to be about uh, this old grizzled sergeant who uh, was about ready to get out of the army, and he comes across these uh, three or four re uh, recruits uh, who uh, weren't being very good soldiers. You know, they were uh, uh, they didn't know much about uh, the history of the fort and all that kind of stuff. So he sits down and starts telling them, "Well, I'd heard this before, but." Uh, I didn't really believe it. A lot of writers say that the characters tell you where the story's going to go, and that's basically what happened with me. Um, I started writing, and uh, I would write something, and I'd say, well, no, he wouldn't say that. And so I would write again, and it just, at times, it just kind of flowed. I just knew the characters, and this is what they were going to do. And, um, but I based it uh, on uh, actual things that happened in four days. So, so this, these were historical novels that I was writing. Uh, a lot of it is uh, activities that took place, people that were there, uh, and that that's the history part of it. But I invented a few characters and I invented a lot of dialogue and that sort of thing to keep the story going. And uh, that's what I came out with. At first, I was just going to write a book. Um, but it turned out uh, that one book didn't do it all. And uh, so uh, I've written the second one. Um, the first book, uh, War Clouds on the High Plains, uh, which I guess is that big poster there. Um, that was the first one. That was published in 2020. And um, the second one was just published. Uh, it's uh, Stones, Bullets, and Blood, which looks book, 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 book. which is right down here. Uh, and, uh, and that tells uh, another uh, part of the story. What happened is uh, they all are under, they all will be, the two are and the others will be under the envelope of uh, the tales of the Sergeant Major. And what this amounts to is that you have a new Sergeant Major at Fort Hayes. He comes in in 1888. Uh, the year before the fort closed. And uh, Sergeant Major is the highest uh, enlisted rank in the Army at that time. And he's in charge of all the other uh, enlisted men. And of course, officers are in charge of more than that, but, but that's his job. Uh, and uh, he, when he gets to Fort Hayes, he finds that not everybody is really soldierly uh, at Fort Hayes. And he, he narrows it down to these five recruits that are just not very good soldiers. And he finds out that they're ready to be, be, uh, to, uh, uh, to be booted out of the service. Uh, and for some reason, when he sees these five guys, he thinks that this is my goal. I mean, I can't let these guys uh, leave the army. Uh, they've got to be able to be trained to be good soldiers. And he says, I think I can do that. So he goes to his commander and he said, 
He says this, and the commander says, okay, you've got a few months, you can do that, but you have to maintain your regular job too uh, in doing this. And so, uh, so we learn a little bit about uh, Sergeant Barrett. I'm gonna read, his name is Sergeant Thomas Barrett. This is uh, a, uh, see it over there, but this is uh, a photo I found on the internet uh, painting that was done many years ago, and it shows Sergeant Major, you can tell by the stripes here, three up and three down. Uh, and he's wearing the, the summer helmet uh, of the army in the 1880s. And uh, so, and this kind of looks like uh, what I imagined Sergeant Thomas Barrett uh, would be like. There's a big description of him physically and all that kind of stuff and what he was doing in the beginning of the book. But uh, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from uh, the beginning of uh, uh, War Clouds on the High Plains that tells you a little bit more about Thomas Barrett and who he is uh, and so on. So here goes. Thomas Barrett was one of only a few enlisted men on post who had his own quarters. It came with the rank. Uh, most of the enlisted men lived in Barrett's buildings, but he was pretty high ranking, so he had his own house. He was more than just a soldier. As Sergeant Major of the 18th Regiment of Infantry, he was ultimately responsible for all the enlisted men on, in the regiment. Of course, the other non-commissioned officers had some of those same responsibilities as well, but the Sergeant Major oversaw all of them. His job was mostly administrative, yet he felt a great responsibility for the conduct and deportment of the men under his command. His only regret in achieving the rank was that his job would not allow him as much interaction with the men as he would like. He was a personable man and craved that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the men, seeking out opportunities to talk, to talk with the men, meet recruits, observe their activities, and advise and correct when and where necessary. Some of the other NCOs would no doubt consider this an intrusion on their duties, but for him, it was his way of leading by example. They would just have to adapt. And then uh, he takes these five guys and he, he pulls them out of the companies that they were in. Fort Hayes at this point had three companies of uh, the 18th Regiment of Infantry. A regiment was uh, one of the basic uh, parts of the army back in those days. And a regiment was composed of 10 companies and each company had about 100 men, anywhere from 65 to 100 men, depending on, on uh, availability and that kind of thing. So he takes these guys out of those companies and he lines them up in front of him Kind of like that. Uh, and this is where he introduces himself to them. And uh, basically, he goes on to tell them they were, they're his now. He's, he's uh, going to train them. So he has uh, his descriptive list of these five guys. A descriptive list was just a little paper that had uh, the man's name and, uh, you know, brown hair, brown eyes, whatever. And, and uh, that kind of thing, and a little bit about their time in the army, uh, which for these guys wasn't very long. They'd only been in the army a few months. So here are the five guys. And uh, Sergeant Barrett says, Private William Brown of Bowser, Company B. Here, the man said, Barrett looked up. Here, what? Here, Sergeant Major. Bowser had a bulldog look about him. He was barrel chested, slightly bow legged, and had reddish hair with a bushy mustache. He spoke with a slight southern accent. You a Reb, Bowser? Weren't born till after the war, Sergeant Major. We'll see. Barrett flipped the page up. Private Michael Houlihan, Company B. Here, Sergeant Major, how old are you, Houlihan? Houlihan gave a very curious look. 21. Really? <laughs> of course, Sergeant Major. You shave yet? When I need to, Sergeant Major. Yeah. <laughs> Private Jasper Brady, Company D. Here, Sergeant Ray Major. Brady was utterly unremarkable. Average height, average build, dark hair, no distinguishing fair physical characteristics. Where are you from, Brady? He asked. Iowa, Sergeant Major. Hmm. Nice country, bear. Flip the sheep to the next man. Private Alonzo Duck, Company D. Here, Sergeant Major. Duck was a stout man who, like Bowser, had a walrus mustache. But unlike any of the other men, he carried more than just a chip on his shoulder. 
that your real name, Duck? Lonzo was my grandfather's name, Sergeant Major, Major, he said with a wry smile. Duck, is Duck your real name? I was going to use another name to get into this infernal blue boy club. I sure as hell not use Duck. <laughs> Private Israel Love, Company H. Here, Sergeant Major, before you go to ask him, yes, that is my real name. Love was trim and muscular with a noticeable scar across his cheek under his right eye. His smile revealed a chipped front tooth. You a fighter, Love? All of us Texans know how to handle ourselves, Sergeant Major. Defending yourself is one thing, Barrett said, but I don't want any of you men starting a fight with anybody else unless they insult America, the Army, or me. Got it? Yeah. Sounds right there, me, Love said. So uh, that's the introduction of those five guys. And Barrett, originally, he, all he wanted to do was just train and be good soldiers. But they also had uh, kind of attitudes. Uh, and he didn't know what really to do about that until one of the, one of the guys, uh, the private Houlihan, says, what was it like out here? They learned that he was out uh, in uh, Kansas uh, in the early days, right after the Civil War. Barrett has his own backstory. He was, uh, he's been a lifelong army guy. He started in the Civil War and uh, here it is 1889 or 1888 and he's still in the army. He's, he's proud of that and uh, he's an army fellow through and through. And uh, so he starts telling uh, Houlihan about what it was like out at uh, Fort Hayes in the early days. And it all began he starts at the beginning, and it all began with the Smoky Hill Trail. And uh, you may know the Smoky Hill Trail uh, went, uh, it's just a little bit south of here, went uh, basically along the Smoky Hill River. And this map, get out of the way, so see, um, the, obviously the red dot is this uh, line is, uh, is the Smoky Hill Trail. And you have Fort Ellsworth here, Fort Fletcher, and then Fort Walls. So there we'll get to Fort Fletcher here in a second. And then all these little stations along here. Um, the trail was originally a, a, a route to get from uh, the eastern United States or the Missouri, Kansas area uh, to Denver during the gold rushes of the 1850s. And, uh, but along comes this guy up here, David Butterfield, who uh, thought he was a businessman and entrepreneur, and he felt that, uh, and he was a real guy, obviously, in this picture there, uh, and he decided that he could uh, uh, create a stage and freight line along the Smoky Hill Trail, uh, and he called it Butterfield's Overland Dispatch. Now, the Smoky Hill Trail was uh, a preferred trail in many ways, because it was a straight shot across Kansas uh, out to Denver. Uh, it was about two weeks faster than going up along the Platte River, River Road in Nebraska and down to Denver, or the Santa Fe Trail down south and then up to Denver. So it had that going for it, but there, was no, there were no forts out here. There was no army protection. And uh, once you got into Eastern Colorado, you start running out of water and those kind of things. So it was, it was uh, not necessarily uh, the easiest travel. So Butterfield has this trail and uh, in the beginning um, they start setting up these stations along here and there's a fellow that uh, traveled that uh, Richard Musgrove, Captain Richard Musgrove from New Hampshire and uh, he was a real person and he uh, left a diary of his trip out of west. He was in the Civil War as well but right toward the end of the war, he was uh, sent out west with some troops and he joined an expedition uh, of many, many wagons, uh, 60 or so wagons on this particular trip. Uh, and uh, he was to see, he and other soldiers were to see that they got out uh, to Denver safely. Well, uh, he'd never been out on the plains before. And uh, so he, uh, was not experienced, didn't have anything to know, any knowledge of the Indians that were living here. This was Cheyenne and Arapaho country. And uh, obviously they didn't like all this activity coming through their hunting grounds and so on. And um, 
So this is Musgrove's, this is from Musgrove's diary. Uh, for the sake of the story, I, I changed his name from McGrath. Uh, but this is uh, essentially a, a fact here uh, with my uh, dialogue uh, put in there. And this is his first encounter with the Indians. Captain Richard McGrath was just, had just laid down on the cot in his tent when Private Kaiser called to him from outside. He put his book down in the chest next to his cot, irritated at the interruption, and angrily sighed, what is it, Private? If you please, sir, said Private Kaiser, there are Indians about. McGrath was instantly alert. Indians, he repeated as he pulled on his boots. Pushing the tent flap aside, he asked, where are they? And buckled on his pistol coat. Private Kaiser pointed to a bluff to the east of their camp. Over the hill, sir, at Livingston's camp. Livingston was a character on this, that he was a real character too on this expedition. And he was afraid that the other teamsters uh, were gonna steal the stuff in his wagons uh, at night. So he would not camp with the others, the other 60 or so uh, wagons. Uh, he camped out by himself. So uh, I knew that Livingston character was gonna be a problem, McGrath muttered as he ran toward the hill. Yes, sir, responded Private Kaiser. It was not like McGrath to make such complaints in front of the enlisted men. It was unprofessional and ungentlemanly. But his frustration with Livingston had been an ongoing issue since the expedition began a week earlier. As they reached the top of the bluff, the two soldiers got down and crawled toward the summit to, miss, to be less likely to be seen. Sergeant Bartlett and several other enlisted men were there as well. McGrath extended his brass field glass and put it to his eye. He saw a small group of nine supply wagons drawn into a circle. The mules were grazing outside the circle of wagons when a party of at least 50 Cheyenne Indians swooped down on the inadequately guarded camp. They were riding around the besieged men, shouting and yelling, all the while waving blankets and robes in an attempt to stampede the mules, a tactic that was working exceedingly well. The Teamsters, undoubtedly new to the prairie, offered not the least resistance. Before McGrath had time to order his men to form up and go to the Teamsters' rescue, every last mule in the train, 57 in all, were flying over the prairie, the Indians in hot pursuit. McGrath turned to Sergeant Parker next to him. Get a detail of 25 men under arms at once, Sergeant. There's a little teaser about what's going on there. So uh, one of the things that they also did on this uh, trip was to really get Fort Fletcher established. Fort Fletcher was originally called Forks Big Creek because it was where uh, Big Creek and the North Fork of Big Creek met. And uh, this fort had been planned. And uh, this is the only um, illustration of Fort Fletcher that's known to exist. Uh, it, was, it was drawn by Theodore Davis here, and you can see that the trail goes right through the center here, uh, and the soldiers camped on either side. And, um, and anyway, the, the, uh, the, the fort was established there, and uh, it was the forerunner of Fort Hayes. So it was open from 1865, the fall of 65, to the spring of 66. So it was only open for six months because at that point, Butterfield, who ran the Butterfields over the dispatch, went bankrupt because of all the Indian attacks uh, on his, on his uh, stagecoaches and, and uh, uh, freight wagons and things like that. He went bankrupt. Well, since no one was using the trail uh, for that anymore, uh, they closed Fort Fletcher in the spring of 66. Uh, in the fall of 66, they reopened Fort Hayes, I mean Fort Fletcher, because the Union Pacific, well at the time, the Kansas Pacific Railway was being built and it was basically following the Smoky Hill Trail. So uh, they moved the fort about a quarter of a mile north of its previous location. And this is the only known photograph of uh, that fort, which was once it was moved, Fort Fletcher was moved, they renamed it Fort Hayes. And uh, you can see this looks pretty rustic here. Uh, 
log or stone, or maybe even uh, saw buildings here. Uh, and uh, at, at this point, it's it's been abandoned. But um, when they moved it over there, it was a thriving little fort, and there was a, a group of officers and their wives that were stationed here. And two of those women left uh, diaries uh, and stories uh, that they wrote about what happened there. And one of those was Elizabeth Custer, George Custer's wife. He called her Libby. And uh, what is particularly interesting in my mind uh, about this particular fort here and those accounts is the storm that occurred there. Uh, there was a huge storm that hit the fort uh, about uh, sundown, the left sundown, and lasted until dawn. So it was a huge storm. And um, I've always wondered about that storm. What exactly was it and how did it form and all that kind of stuff? Well, luckily, my son-in-law is a PhD in meteorology. Meteorologist. So he sat down and talked about it a little bit, and I read up on storms and things like that. And so in the book, I described the storm, the forming of the storm, and, and uh, how it uh, proceeded, and, and that kind of thing, uh, which I think is a pretty accurate uh, rendition of how this form actually, how this storm actually took place. But it's interesting that they, that these two ladies left uh, an account of the storm, and so I was taken those accounts and I've uh, uh, created, uh, again, created dialogue and so on. And so this is uh, uh, as the storm approaches the fort. A boom interrupted the conversation and the assembled men and women looked to the west. The bass drummer, they just had a concert uh, for the men. The bass drummer had tripped and fallen, losing control of his drum, which rolled across the parade ground, coming to a rest with an audible thump against the flagpole. A flash of lightning demanded their attention. My, that storm seems to be building, said Peggy Gibbs, wife of the commander. Yes, yes, it does, agreed Gibbs. I thought it was going to miss us, said Diana, who was a friend of the music. Well, we might get a little something out of it, said Gibbs, but I shouldn't worry. Do you ladies need anything? No, thank you, Major, said Libby. I think we'll be just fine. Good night. Come on, Diana. The storm was moving steady and robust now. It had been building for quite a while. If there had been any chance it would miss the fort, that chance was long gone. Soon, the booms they heard were not runaway bass drums. The thunder began to come in rapid volleys of cloud artillery, and the blinding lightning produced an incessant flash that illuminated the interiors of the canvas tents. And then the heavens loosed their reins in torrents. The ground, still muddy from recent rains, could hold a little more, and the water soon began to run down toward the valley of the creek. Trees started to bend unnaturally from the force of the intense cold winds and the downdrafts, and an unearthly howl arose from the tortured trees, causing the men and women of the garrison to search their souls for any mortal sin they have, may have committed that had brought such terrible tempest to their small camp. That's the beginning of it. And then it gets pretty exciting with uh, uh, the ladies were on a hill and the hill got surrounded by water and, and the officers had to go rescue them. And, and there's a little surprise to the ending to that, which I won't uh, spoil <laughs> if you read the book. But uh, it's a very interesting, uh, this photo was taken after that flood. And after the flood, they moved Fort Hayes from where it was, which is actually five miles uh, due south of Walker, Kansas, uh, is where that fort was, Fort Fletcher, and then the first four days. They moved it 15 miles to the west, to the, where on the south edge of what is now Hayes, is where they uh, established the, the new fort. And this is taken after that flood. You can see that the fort is basically abandoned. Uh, there are a few men standing right in here but there's no flag on the flagpole. And this rubble here is a building that was there that was collapsed by the flood and actually got up into the fort. And this is the parade ground that they were talking about, that they talked about with the drum hitting the flagpole and, and that sort of thing. So, so when they moved the fort, it became something like this. Uh, this was drawing was made 
in about 1888 or 1889, about the time that that uh, the story that uh, I just relayed uh, to you uh, uh, with with the sergeant major and so on. Uh, so this is basically what it looked like then. Nice. Uh, uh, Nicely laid out, uh, plenty of officers' quarters here. These white buildings, these yellow ones are barracks buildings for the enlisted men. He had stables over there and a hospital, and, and it was pretty nice. It lasted for about 25 years before they closed it. Well, uh, and this is where the second book comes in The Stones, Bullets, and Blood. And it has three basic stories. Uh, the first uh, is about the blockhouse here, which I've always wanted to write about because it's a very mysterious, it's interesting, interesting, interesting building. It's the first building built at the fort uh, when it was moved over to Hayes. And uh, it was done by these two guys here. Micah Brown was a lieutenant. He was an engineer, very intelligent fellow, uh, graduated from West Point. Uh, and Captain uh, Samuel Lawfer here was uh, not quite so. He was, uh, he was a Civil War veteran, but uh, he didn't really take part in any battles or anything like that. He was a quartermaster, uh, which is an important job. Uh, but when it came out to Fort Hayes here, he was required to build this building that, that uh, Brown designed. And uh, he wasn't doing a very good job of it. And so the story is about the the conflict between Brown and Lawford. And uh, since it was in my mind, I thought, oh, people might find this a little boring. I stuck some humor in there. I stuck some, <laughs> some characters in there that provide uh, a little bit of humor into it. Uh, another story in there is about uh, the doctor uh, at the fort in 1870. He wrote a book or wrote a report on the map of the, the zoology of Fort Hayes. And the doctors were typically the most educated men on a fort. And they were responsible for uh, not only doctoring, but uh, they were the local scientists, the weatherman, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, took weather readings. And they also were required to go out around whatever fort they were stationed at and uh, do things like collect animal specimens, collect plant specimens, um, and uh, look at the geology. And all this kind of stuff was sent back to Washington, to the Smithsonian. Uh, and that's where we learned a lot about the, the uh, flora and fauna and geology of the Western United States is from these doctors. And uh, so uh, the story is uh, primarily uh, fiction, uh, but the doctor goes out and he's uh, on by himself and he's out collecting some animals and gets attacked by a, a hungry mountain lion. His horse actually gets attacked. And uh, so it's a story about uh, that it has a lot of uh, uh, animal animals in it that were actually here, like bears and, and uh, mountain lions and stuff like that. Mountain lions coming back, actually. The third story is this, uh, the Battle of the Saline River which almost everything in here other than the dialogue is actual fact. This battle took place uh, in 1867 and it was uh, just uh, about 20 miles north of Hayes, right along the Saline River. So it's not too far east of here. And what happened was uh, there were some Indian attacks uh, on uh, the surveyors. They were building a railroad through here, as I mentioned earlier. And there were seven construction workers that were over near the present town of Victoria, and they were uh, set upon by about a dozen, there were seven of them, and there was about a dozen Indians. They surprised them, and the guys didn't have guns or anything like that. Uh, but the Indians killed them all. And today, even uh, on the uh, western edge of Victoria, there's a little cemetery there with uh, those guys buried right there. Um, and when that happened, uh, the, the men at the fort first uh, got word of that. And so this man here, Gen uh, Captain George Arms, uh, was uh, in charge of, uh, he was had a company of the 10th Cavalry, which were the Buffalo Soldiers, and uh, which you can see in this drawing here. And um, 
This was an important battle. It was a small battle and doesn't get much press or anything, but it was an important battle because it's the first time that the Buffalo soldiers were involved in any great extent with the Native Americans. So this is the first time that the Cheyenne Indians uh, here even came across these black soldiers. Uh, these were black soldiers led by a white officer is the way they did it back in those days. And Arms himself is a pretty interesting character. He's, uh, um, he's really full of himself, and which he actually was. And a few years after this battle, he got booted out of the army for, for something. And he spent the rest of his life trying to get back in the army. He really loved the army a lot, uh, even though he wasn't a very good commander. Uh, and uh, there was a one battle after this, but those are the only two battles that he was given command of. He never served in the field again, just because uh, he just wasn't very good. Because both uh, battles uh, ended up uh, basically a draw, I guess you might say. Uh, but they were both essentially failures. But uh, these guys uh, went from Fort Hayes, went uh, east to about Victoria, where the men were killed, and then started following the Indians' trail up along uh, the uh, Saline River. And so they get up uh, um, about, like I said, about 20 miles north of Hayes. And uh, that's where they get set upon by the Indians. And they were, uh, they were tracking 12 Indians or so. Uh, by the time they got into battle with the Indians, that had grown to, uh, there were other Indians that came in and joined the original 12, uh, anywhere from two to 400 Indians. Uh, and these guys are only 40 some of them, 42 or 43 uh, of the soldiers. So this is, the introduction of Buffalo soldiers to uh, Indian warfare. Private Anderson, riding out on the left flank, momentarily disappeared as he ascended the far side of a small hill parallel to the main column at about 200 yards out. This had happened numerous times since sunup, and he always reappeared, often at or near the summits of those hills. He was never out of sight for more than a minute or two at most. It was as crucial for his safety that he keep the column in sight as it was for the welfare of the column to be able to see him. Lieutenant Bodemer saw the flanker disappear and estimated where and when he would disappear on the opposite side of the, who would reappear on the opposite side of the hill. But as most everyone else in the, in the column was doing, he did not concentrate on just one spot. His eyes were constantly scanning the horizon, looking for telltale movements in the grass and that an unnatural silhouette behind clumps of bushes or within trees along the river, any place an Indian or group of Indians might hide, waiting to spring an ambush or rush the column. The hills to the south were, at, were an obvious concern, but Private Anderson had that aspect, aspect well in hand. He should come, be coming into view about now. Nope. I must have miscalculated, thought Bodemer, as he made another visual sweep of the path. Surely by now, again, nothing. Captain, he said. Yes, Lieutenant, responded Captain Arms. The left franker has been out of view for an inordinate amount of time, sir. Call a halt, Arms called as he, as he held up his right arm. His order was repeated down the line as the men stopped. What is it now, asked Sergeant Thornton. It's Anderson, said Sergeant Christie. He's been out of view for a while. I've been watching him. Should we send somebody out, said Corporal. I'm not in charge of that, said Christie, as Corporal Butter came riding toward them. Captain wants you to send somebody to check on the left flank, he said. That's what we figured, said Thornton. No need to now, said Christie. Here he comes. Private Anderson was at full gallop as he crested the hill and was raking the, rouse, the small rouse of his cavalry spurs along the flanks of his mount at a rapid rate to coax every possible bit of speed from the horse. As he got closer, they could begin to hear the private's anxious warning, Indians. So there's a few, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting. Not only was this the first uh, action, uh, significant action between the Buffalo soldiers and the Indians, but it was the first casualty of the Buffalo soldiers, the first death 
that occurred. Uh, but there weren't very many deaths at all in this battle, even though it lasted all day. Uh, and the soldiers were in what was called a defensive square, as you can see here, sort of. Uh, and uh, it was also called a walking square. They could walk that anywhere they needed to go uh, and still maintain uh, safety in the rate of fire. But the Indians were circling around them this whole time, shooting and so on. But very few casualties on either side. So uh, it was kind of amazing that they got out of that. In fact, that's what the commander, that's what Arm said. He said, it's a miracle that that uh, we weren't uh, annihilated. So those are a little bit of teasers, few teasers uh, from my books. And uh, I do appreciate, uh, again, uh, the opportunity to share this with you as a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, there are still more stories. Cap uh, uh, Sergeant Major Barrett, he has a backstory. All these five men have a backstory and they'll run through all the books until we finally learn all about uh, those uh, six men, sergeant and, and, the, and the five uh, uh, recruits. So uh, so hopefully I'm working on a third book now and uh, there's gonna be at least four, I don't know, maybe more. It just depends on how it comes. So. But I appreciate it. Remember, if there's any questions or anything like that, uh, I'd be glad to try and answer them. We do have books here for sale. Uh, I appreciate Melanie and her staff for allowing me to, to do that uh, while I'm here. So, Is yes, the M4A still standing? Yes, there are four buildings uh, there. Two of them were stone buildings, the guardhouse and the blockhouse. So I can get back to that. That blockhouse there is still standing? Yes. Uh, here's the blockhouse. Um, on the fort, and then the guardhouse was back here at the prison. Those were both built out of stone, at limestone. And so when the fort closed, all the buildings were torn down, except uh, for those two. And then there were a couple of buildings, officers' quarters, that were sold and moved into town. And two of those eventually came back and they're sitting right here. And so uh, the visitor center is currently right in this area here. And, and but most everything else, uh, is gone. We keep thinking that maybe there's another building out there someplace, but we haven't been able to, to find it. So there are four buildings there, and they're they're pretty well done. They, the officers' quarters are set up like homes, and and uh, uh, the guardhouse and blockhouse have a number of exhibits. And the blockhouse is just a fascinating building. So, yes, ma'am. Is there any real truth to the spirits that were on that campus? You know, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm sure you're talking about Elizabeth Pauley, the blue light lady. And uh, there are uh, people on both sides of that issue. Um, I have never seen anything. I worked there for 28 some years uh, and I've never seen anything or experienced anything, but others have. And um, I, uh, I, I, at one point, I told people, if they asked about Elizabeth Pauley, I told them, well, you know, she's a legend, and that's good. I mean, legends are good. Uh, the folklore of a, of a community is, is important. And, good. and she's kind of a legend, and uh, she's uh, been a very uh, nice ghost. I mean, she doesn't come out and slime anybody or any of that kind of stuff. She just walks around. And um, I... I was uh, giving a couple of uh, elderly ladies a, a tour with one lady in town who brought her friend out and uh, she asked about it and, and, I, and I told her, well, you know, there's a lot of stories, but I've never seen anything. And this one lady that was from Hayes turned to me and she said, look, Elizabeth and Polly's real and I don't want to hear another word about it. So she got after me for saying, well, I don't know. But, <laughs> You know, I've had, I've had people uh, talk about things. Uh, we had an event there one time where the, uh, we had some uh, people who do black powder stuff and they were there and uh, they stayed overnight and they had a fire on and everything. And as one guy who was not one to joke around or, or you know, uh, anything like that, uh, we had some porta potties out there so he went to the, using facilities and on his way back, he passed 
a guy that was a Buffalo soldier. And he thought as he passed him, he thought, I didn't know we had any Buffalo soldier reactors here or anything. And so he uh, turned to invite him over to their campfire and he wasn't there. And we didn't have any Buffalo soldiers that, that year. So I don't know, people have seen uh, uh, spirits or whatever you uh, might call it in these two officers' homes, even though they were both moving into town and moved back. Um, and they swear up and down. I mean, there are people that don't know one another uh, and they had similar experiences. And so, so I don't know. We've, uh, we had a guy that was trying to research Elizabeth Pauley and uh, he found that, uh, there, well, Ephraim Pauley was uh, the post uh, hospital steward. The hospital steward was a rank in the army and he was basically a male nurse. And um, he was actually a real person. He was there. And uh, he supposedly was married to a Catherine Polly. So I think maybe that's, that's it. But he ended up uh, getting married about four times. And the first time was this Catherine, and the last time was the same, same thing. So we don't know. We don't know. Uh, but I tell you, one time I had, uh, I was given a tour. I remember this very vividly. I was down here. We had a special event going on. I was down here on this end of the, the guardhouse, and I was talking to some people, and this guy comes running up from the visitor center, and he says, uh, where's that, where's that uh, Elizabeth Polly buried at? And I said, well, she's right out here. There's a hill out here, so you can see it. The, the uh, stone, uh, not the headstone, but a monument that they put out there. The nursing students did back in the 60s or 70s. They put a monument out there to Elizabeth Paul. And uh, he said, well, can you get out there? I said, well, it's on private land. People go down there, out there quite a lot. Uh, and I told him how to probably get there and stuff. And he said, well, thanks. I'm really interested in this because uh, she was my great, great grandma. <laughs> so, and, and other relatives of the Polly family came through the fort in later years, and they knew all about the story and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, at one point, uh, their uh, grandmother, who was one of the other four, uh, one of the four, said, uh, had told them, I don't want any mention of her in my presence. And so, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I kind of wish I'd see something. But I, I, I got a granddaughter that when we did historical tour of all over the state when I went down there, my travel And we went to Hayes, and I don't know who did the tour with us. Might have been you, I don't know. Hey, she's seven, 16 now, but she was probably only about seven. And my other, and then, well, maybe not, I don't know. But then we went to Garden City, and in Custer's house, there is also supposedly some spirits in Custer. Oh, in Junction City? In Junction City, yeah, yes. Yeah. For Grant. <coughs> well, one of the two. And boy, she asked yes. a hundred questions about all this. And so yeah, it's always fun. The, the Custers live lived there in, uh, in, uh, at Fort Riley for a while. And what's interesting about that is that there are people who work there, who there were strange things happening, stuff like that, but, and they attributed to either Elizabeth or George, but the truth is they lived in a build, the building right next to it, which has since been torn down, so I don't know if they migrated over to the other house, <laughs> but, you know, it's hard to tell, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving up on it, I, you know, I've never seen it, but uh, there are people who I know. Thank you. Interesting. So Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, great. Thank you very much. Now we're going to have a fight over this green and my wife and I. Well, maybe we'll give that to our grants. He likes green. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have books over here. And we're not really for that, but we have books also for sale. Uh, the, the tales that are uh, Word, Word Clouds on the High Plains is $10, or $15, $10, and uh, Stones, Bulls, and Blood is 15 or you can buy both of them for 20 so, 
Anyway. No. Uh, I've had a lot of people say, well, you gotta put that on audio, and I don't I don't know how to do that. 